Thank you very oh, much, oh. every. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, this is Gojian's uh, first Wednesday of every month's webinar. So this is October and uh, October the fourth. So this is first Wednesday in October. So here we are, and uh, you can't see me. So this is Bea de los Arcos speaking to you from Galway in the west of Ireland, and it's a really blustery and awful day. Um, but everything is now brightened up because we have with us two wonderful women from South Africa. Um, we've got Laura Tierniewicz and Sukaina Walji, and I think I've met the two of them uh, in one way or another through the, like the connection that the OER Hub has with the War for D project. I'm sure you know about the War for D project, but if you don't know, go ahead and check them up because they've got, they've done wonderful, wonderful stuff. So I met Sukaina and Laura last during the OER 17 conference and uh, they gave a presentation, if not exactly this one, a very similar presentation, which I thought was great because it's this, um, you know, it, it spoke to me at, you know, this idea of community in, engagement and the idea of impact and, and also, I wanted somebody to come and talk to us um, talking about MOOCs uh, with the, the, the openness context, but also talking about MOOCs. So MOOCs is always, some people say they're open or they're not open. We've, we've got this debate. So I'm really, really happy uh, that they accepted the, the, the invitation. So I'm going to um, I'm gonna go and be quiet and let them let them speak. Um, leave your questions, your comments on the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on what what goes on. Uh, but see, uh, Laura and Sukina will take questions towards the end of the presentation. Okay, so thank you so much. Go ahead. Thank you, and thanks very much for inviting us. Sukina and I will be doing this together. I'm going to start. And we're going to talk about one aspect of our MOOCs uh, project, focusing on MOOCs community, community orientation and reclaiming the social justice agenda with insights from our particular MOOC project. We can all remember those many years ago, all of five years back when MOOCs started or when the year of the MOOC launched how they were premised on promises of access and inclusion, of participation, and really around the democratization of education. And Daphne Collier, from, who was at Coursera at the time, said, if we could offer a top quality education to everyone around the world for free, it would establish education as a fundamental human right, where anyone around the world with the ability and the motivation could get the skills that they needed to make a better life. So these were really fine principles on which MOOCs were founded. But there were almost immediately some serious criticisms of MOOCs, justifiable criticisms, which included the fact that they largely reached the elite, so the, the well-educated, the highly qualified throughout the world, that they are generally a broadcast model, so the danger that they are one too many, and that they're, in fact, perhaps not open at all, that they might be more closed than open. And, of course, one of the major criticisms for those of us concerned of, for a global south or a marginalized perspective that they perpetuate neocolonialism. And there was a wonderful um, blog posting that Sharma wrote in 2013 where he spoke about the evangelical arguments and self-appointed saviors of the less civilized ruling the airways on the global front. So those were, were strong words. But what we would argue is that you should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, although those criticisms are fair and valid and important, those original foundational claims are still very importantly worth engaging with. And that's what we have done in this presentation, which is to take a social inclusion perspective on MOOCs. And here we draw on Gidley's work and we thank um, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams and Henry Trotter for drawing our attention to Gidley, who says that social inclusion can be understood as pertaining to a nested schema regarding de degrees of inclusion. 
The narrowest interpretation pertains to the neoliberal notion of social inclusion as access. And that's the one that's most commonly spoken about when it comes to MOOCs. But a broader interpretation regards the social justice idea of social inclusion as participation. Whilst the widest interpretation involves the human potential lens of social inclusion as empowerment. And that nested schema is visually represented here with access closely linked to a neoliberal approach. And here one would be drawing on human capital theory, social capital theory, and free market econ economics. I think that those comments by Daphne Collier fall fairly and squarely in this access neoliberal uh, paradigm. The social justice agenda, which is the one we're more interested in, focuses on participation. And here we'd be looking at par partnership theory, critical pedagogy, and also feminist theories. And the, the, that very important scheme of empowerment is really about human pot potential. And here, post-colonial theories and pedagogies of hope are the ones that are most closely linked to that approach. If you apply the degrees of social inclusion lens to MOOCs, access is either a given, which it often is, or it's not enough. So if one is striving towards social adjust, uh, so social justice agenda, the danger is that by looking at access by itself, you might well reinforce existing inequalities, and we've certainly seen that in the MOOC space. So our interest is in whether and to what extent MOOCs offer opportunities for participation and for empowerment. And here we see MOOC making as an intentional process rather than a product. So not MOOCs as a, a thing, but a process that might enable social inclusion. And we wonder what this would look like. The questions that we try and answer here are, how can MOOCs enable inclusivity of civil society and non-university parties? How can MOOCs enable co-creation and reuse? And how can MOOCs center the community? And to do this, I'm just going to describe the MOOCs at UCT and then hand over to Sukena. The MOOC project at UCT has got a portfolio of uh, originally 12 MOOCs. We've actually got a few more now. And they are particular types of MOOCs. So teaching MOOCs that showcase teaching, um, research MOOCs that showcase research, Professional MOOCs that showcase professional careers, and that's where the entire MOOC space has tended to focus. And then MOOCs that focus on graduate literacies and gateway skills, so the transitions between school and undergraduate, and the transitions between undergraduate and postgraduate. And the MOOCs project at UCT has tried to work in all those spheres, all those types of MOOCs. And for the purposes of today's presentation, we're going to look at three of the MOOCs that we have developed so far. Social innovations, writing your world, and education for all. So one of those is a professional, an example of a professional careers focus. One of those is showcasing teaching. And one of those is a type of MOOC that we call gateway skills. And at this point, I'll hand over to Sukena. OK, thanks, Laura. Um, so in order to look at the um, sort of social inclusion perspective and, and you know, where MOOCs might be able to contribute or for, for us to understand where MOOCs are contributing, we've taken some examples of what we're seeing in three of these um, MOOCs uh, that we feel have a particular community orientation. And I'll just talk through some examples. We don't have a kind of grand conclusion. We're just working from observations, um, learner feedback, and um, some of the kind of very interesting stories that um, are coming out of the MOOC project where we are working. So Education for All, um, Disability, Diversity and Inclusion is a MOOC, one of our first MOOCs that's hosted on the Future Learn platform. It is designed for uh, primarily for the professional development of teachers working in resource constrained environments. Um, and it is the ethos behind it is not that it's just and um, just for teachers, but the, the the story behind it is that the educators wanted to present the discipline and the practice as being partnership and um, including stakeholders 
that include teachers but also schools very much their approach, um, their teaching approach in their formal programs and for which they decided on a MOOC. So if we just perhaps work through some of the, um, the kind of mini impacts or the examples, um, then we can see whether we, we are moving beyond access. So first of all, um, in, just in terms of simple access, um, the MOOC, as I said, it was intended to reach people who in resource constrained environments where including um, school children um, in an inclusive ways children with disabilities but also children a broader in inclusion level um, and so we did find that this uh, course was taken up in all sorts of contexts and that's just a quote there from the um, one of the conveners who who's who's stating her um, aim that she would, her hope was that this MOOC would um, infiltrate into villages and little towns. She's saying in Ghana, Nigeria, various African countries, low and middle income countries. Um, and we see that at least in terms of take up, that uh, we did find that, that this was happening and in not insignificant numbers. Um, and considering that this was a MOOC offered on the FutureLearn platform, we were very pleased at the, the take up and breadth um, across these particular contexts. And this also, um, we've not too far. We also found that the MOOC reached people um, across the different stakeholder communities. I'm just trying to move that. Just a little bit of a lag. Ooh, okay. Um, it did reach uh, lots of intended audiences, um, apart from teachers, um, parents, health professionals. Um, school principals, uh, as well as um, people who identify themselves as just uh, as educators rather than school teachers. Um, and so that was really kind of the reach and access. And based on that, um, the after the first few runs, the educators were very pleased that it seemed to be hitting the types of audiences that they had envisaged would be interested in the course. Um, one of the things that we, we were very um, aware of when we were developing the course, and I'm part of the um, learning design team, was the educators desire that this not this was this was a MOOC that had to um, come from the community. Um, they were the experts, they're part of the disability studies unit here at the Faculty of Health Sciences, but they really wanted to engage with voices of the community. And so as part of the content development, um, there are lots of case studies and uh, video examples of um, people who are working in this context already and their voices do come through. through. Um, and this was part of a kind of inclusive content development, um, which I think meets some of that kind of participation lens. Um, although it wasn't sort of a deliberate thing, it was just very much the, the educator's approach. And, we did find that, that other people who took the MOOC um, from different contexts acknowledged this. And so this is feedback from a MOOC participant um, from Turkey who's, who commented particularly around what she found useful about the course materials. And here she says, in the past, the only examples of what was being, what would be, what was being done were examples from the uh, US and the UK. And those were not appropriate for countries where the infrastructure is extremely limited, where legislation is nebulous and not implemented, where people did not know about their rights because of the few examples that existed were not transposable. And so what this course tried to do was to actually accept the limited resources and the particular context and work with those. And we did find that that was quite a successful strategy because voices from the community were very much part of the default content. Um, also, right from the beginning, um, we, uh, the educators of the MOOC were quite deliberate in their, their decision to openly license the MOOC in a way that it would serve the purpose, um, which is to offer strategies to make low resource environments more inclusive. I mean, it sounds a bit of a no brainer in some ways, um, but that uh, they deliberately made the course and the way the materials were designed so that people could take them and reuse them. And it was accessibility issues, um, 
such as video, audio, transcripts, a whole suite of kind of strategies to make the uh, content um, downloadable for different uh, you know, bandwidth or preferences and also for um, people with disabilities, uh, but also around um, just being able to reuse it um, in different contexts offline as well. So that was quite quite important in terms of the licensing, which is not the usual thing for, for MOOCs. Um, once the MOOC had launched, we have had quite um, an interesting kind of engagement with the learner community. And uh, we've had very good take up in, in South Africa. And so we've, we, the things have popped up on our radar that we've followed up with. And we found quite a lot of reuse of parts of the MOOC or MOOC materials. And so this is an example where we, there's a, hosp a hospital called the Hate Sprit Hospital, a small rural district hospital in uh, Limpopo province, uh, one of the provinces of South Africa. And the staff or the, the person sort of responsible for staff development um, used the MOOC. Uh, normally, it's the, the hospital is too remote to send occupational therapists for training. So they downloaded the video lectures and they, they used them to stimulate discussion in their context. They weren't always able to take the MOOC um, in its sort of, uh, default format online. Um, but we've had great, we've had really great feedback and um, some indications that it's helped change their strategies towards patient care. Um, so we were very pleased about that, but also just pleased to hear that, that it was possible. We've also had some personal empowerment stories, stories of individual learners. Um, we have a, a student who, after taking the MOOC, joined the University of Cape Town Disability Studies Postgraduate Diploma Program after having been exposed to the MOOC and is therefore um, being uh, part of the kind of new discipline in the new field. We've had um, opportunities for teacher professional development, so informal groups of teachers. Uh, for example, we've heard of groups of teachers studying together in the Eastern Cape. It's one of a number of groups. We've also got some more formal um, opportunities. We just heard yesterday, so they're able to put this in, another university has prescribed the course for its um, education students. It was endorsed by the South African Department of Basic Education. Um, we're currently in discussions for CPD accreditation and the recommendation of the Western Cape Education Department. It's one of the other provinces. And in terms of teacher professional development, we um, might not see it on the screen there, but we made a decision to go for the lowest possible certificate price on the FutureLearn platform of um, £29, which doesn't sound very much in pounds, but it's still quite a bit in rands. Um, but that was our, um, one of our attempts to, for people who would like to use it in a professional development capacity, that the certificate might mean something to them, that we try to go for the lowest, um, the, the most affordable price. So that's some examples from the Education for All course. The next course that um, we thought we'd explore um, through this lens of social inclusion is the um, Becoming a Change Maker Introduction to Social Innovation. This course is offered um, from a unit in our Graduate School of Business. It's the Bertha Centre for Social Innovation. And this is a course that um, is, is about changing mindsets and building um, skills around social innovation and social in entrepreneurship. And it's um, partly a teaching um, showcase course. It's, part, it's a module of the current MBA that's been um, presented in a MOOC format. And also it has um, some pro professional development um, goals and aims as well. This, um, I was quite involved in the uh, content creation um, of this course and right from the very beginning the educators um, told us, the, the learning design team, that their priority while creating this MOOC was to move away from a feeling of, an, of being an ivory tower um, and that they did not want this MOOC to be that they were the experts who were lecturing or, um, or were um, transporting information to people who would then take it up. It was very much um, a co-creation and 
they partnered with a social enterprise based here in Cape Town, but which has an international profile. It's called R Labs, um, and it's a it's a social enterprise, not quite an NGO, um, not quite a non-profit, but but a sort of social enterprise with all of those elements that um, has generated quite an um, amazing um, profile and series of activities around training innovation and entrepreneurship in, in context um, uh, for, for um, community upliftment. And the founder of our lab became one of the lead educators of the course and was one of the lecturers. And the learning design activities were held at the R Lab centers with, their, with staff. And so they were not treated as the case study, but were part of the design team. And so there was participation with stakeholders right from the beginning. I think that's made quite a difference, both to the kind of learning from all parties as to how this kind of um, opportunity um, in, in a MOOC format is, is created together, but also how it can be received. And we've had um, really interesting um, uptake about this course. It's, it's done, it's hosted on the Coursera platform. It's done really well. Um, the feedback has been really, really incredible in terms of the enjoyment that people seem to be having. Um, but what the um, educators' aim has been is to acknowledge that um, the way the MOOC can be um, consumed or reused um, in contexts where connectivity or digital literacies are um, a challenge is around um, having what they call in-person opportunities or in-person classes where the MOOC is taken um, with facilitators, which are sometimes the facilitators have just taken the MOOC and they've gone with it. And sometimes it's been more of a managed process. And we found quite a few examples of mushroom groups that have taken something from MOOC, it's resonated with them and the communities for which it was created with and for have taken this forward into kind of new ways. So we've got classes that are teaching this um, as part of establishing a business at the Cape Town Library that just incorporates the MOOC as part of um, a broader program. And there's also sessions um, in labs with facilitators at what's called the R Labs cafes, which are cafes that have been set up in um, uh, areas that um, you might call sort of you know, low income or low resource areas, and that there's supported access skills, uh, supported access and uh, how to go through the MOOC um, in a facilitated way. And what we've been really um, keen on is we've really leveraged Coursera's financial aid option. So Coursera allows, uh, well, ena enables people to apply if they want a certificate and they can't afford to pay for it for financial aid. And we've heavily marketed that um, as a motivator for people to take the course. And I think the most, what we have found is that the way that the R Labs story and case, um, case studies and participation really has resonated with communities you know, to, to th there's something different about this MOOC. Um, and so one of the um, really nice stories has been empowerment of local facilitators who are interested, perhaps not in the, the core content of the MOOC, but have used some aspects of it for their own um, purposes. So we've met a facilitator at um, the Cape Town uh, City Library, and he's running the course for groups of students. And he takes them through the course. Um, they do all the assignments together. It's part of a broader program. And I was quite struck by, he wrote to me, or he tweeted this to me um, when I asked him how it was going. And he said, I enjoy facilitating the course. It has a huge impact on our students. I can see it in their eyes. That they're ready to take action and taking ownership of their communities rather than waiting for the government. Um, we've had some interesting um, South-South reuse and adaptation of the course. Um, the MOOC was used as the basis for, the, for a facilitated face-to-face -face workshop by um, the GSIR Institute in Egypt. Um, that's uh, a, a training um, entity. And um, we just came across them on Facebook. So we said, hello, we're really excited you're um, doing this course. And in fact, they then invited the South African-based um, educators to join the, fast, the final session. And again, this was also a sort of 
engagement and participants, um, feeding back to the uh, facilitators and the educators around how the MOOC has been received. And I think that's really one of the nice things that we've seen is that the people who've created, developed the MOOCs have actually taken on board quite significantly some of the feedback from participants. We've also had some kind of interesting South-North reuse and adaptation. So we came across a teacher at a school in Baltimore who's running a course in his classroom with a group of 18-year-old girls. Um, and that's because there's no room in the curriculum to teach entrepreneurship. So he's kind of adding it on as part of a, a more holistic curriculum, but is hoping to get it added to school transcripts and the school will pay for certificates. So we're sort of seeing how that goes. And Oxfam really recently contacted us to say that they had offered the course to its worldwide network of employees and that they would sponsor certificates because they were um, really keen that their um, people working across the Oxfam network um, took the course to have a kind of um, broad understanding of some of the themes of the course around social innovation. Um, and then again, we come back to the reuse of open license material and we've become more and more aware of how important this has been um, as part of the, the offering if you are going to consider your MOOCs as being more than access. So this is correspondence that I have with an academic from a Dutch university um, who asked, uh, who emailed, it was part of a quite a long series of emails, and he said, can I use course material in my classes? Um, so besides helping to translate the course of course in Dutch, can we talk about the way in which I can use the material in my normal lectures with full disclosure of copyright? Um, so standing in front of the students and working with them along the lines and steps of your course, and we were delighted to let him know that um, the materials are all licensed for reuse and um, you do not need permission, et cetera, et cetera. And his reply, which isn't there, was kind of fairly incredulous, um, but also said, I'm so happy if you ever come and visit me, I'll take you around. <laughs> and that, there's been some really nice connections. This is sort of typical of um, some of the interactions, even though we're all over Pastado, all over the course, RCC by licenses. People, people were still quite surprised that this was open license, and perhaps it's just because many MOOCs are not. We've also had a bit of reuse in formal teaching. Um, so videos and course materials have been used in other courses run by the Graduate School of Business, um, and that's really leveraging the investment made in the materials, so both in a short course for educators and senior leaders and in the current MBA program as well. And um, we, this course was also part of Coursera's um, Education for Social Impact campaign around trying to bring awareness to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and we've been pleased to participate in that. Part of it is, is marketing and trying to get across um, how the uh, for the sustainable development goals and how people can, by taking a course that has some alignment, um, can do something real um, and practical. And we were quite pleased to be part of that. And we're seeing, this, we're going to see, this is quite recent, so we're going to see how this um, has played out. I'm to use the, the mouse. There we go. All right. And then my last sort of case study is a very new course. And it's just launched. We had the launch event a few weeks ago. It's called Writing Your World, Finding Yourself in the Academic Space. And this is quite a different type of course in the sense that it's one of, it's our only course that is trying to, um, it's, it's our category which is around supporting um, gateway skills. And this is around a course to support students or uh, people who are either entering university for the first time or are going back or, or have never been and are going back and have to engage with academic writing. But there are many, many academic writing courses out there. So while we were designing this course, we really had to ask ourselves or the, the um, education team, what, what was different about this course? What are the real issues for um, students when they come into um, an academic writing space from the kinds of backgrounds that our um, educators see here in South Africa, but also I think um, across the world, especially for students who are first generation university 
um, attendees or are perhaps um, second language English speakers. So this is less a skills course and more a kind of finding your writing identity course. And um, we're seeing how it goes. So we don't have very many examples of feedback. This is more around some of the approaches that we've taken around co-creation. And we will see what level of participation we can achieve. But um, during the content development and creation, there was quite a stress on use of student voices, including real students with real problems. Now, we didn't put the faces of the students in. We, had, uh, we have animated characters, but voiced behind those animation are real students. In fact, when we had the launch, some of the real students arrived and said, I am that character, um, which was a, quite a nice, nice thing. Um, and there's awareness right from the beginning that the MOOC format would be limited for co the constituents who could benefit from this course. We really did ask ourselves, is this really the right format? Um, you know, uh, uh, MOOCs are tricky enough for people to get through as it is. Um, are we really going to find people who are trying to get to university or who have a university entrance place but, but could do with this kind of course? Are they really going to be motivated to do it on their own in a kind of self we're not self-paced, but a kind of self-study mode. And so we, we, we acknowledge this. We do know that this is likely to be um, an issue. And so this the MOOC is really only part of a, a level of engagement um, and participation kind of strategies with local communities. And so for, we have got current plans for wrapping this course with facilitation in low resource schools in Cape Town, as an example, that we might be able to roll out and create a facilitator's guide so that we really want to understand the needs of intended participants around offering this kind of course and these types of materials. So this is very much something that we don't have results for. We're just um, interested to see what will happen in terms of um, participation is because we do know that in this case, access is really not going to be enough. Okay, if you want to take the conclusions, Laura. So, I think these examples are, are really wonderful examples of showing that some of those promises and critiques aren't as contradictory or as polarized as they are often made out to be in the literature. People tend to take an either or view of MOOCs, and I think um, it's much more complex in, in reality. And there's some really exciting examples of how social justice agendas can actually be achieved through MOOCs, especially if one takes a, a, a more complicated schema such as Gidley's to understand what that might look like. What we have come to understand is that the intentions of the educators and that the objectives of the MOOCs are absolutely essential considerations for how this might work in practice and what those educators wanted to do. Um, it's an ongoing process. The, the process orientation rather than the product orientation is much more useful if one is thinking about engaging with a social justice agenda. And what you really can do is you can decenter the course conveners. So often the, the notion of a MOOC with a rock star academic is the way people think about MOOCs, but you can completely decenter those those um, those views of academics as at the heart of MOOCs and create community-centered MOOCs which enable participation and empowerment through co-creation, through foregrounding the community, the student voices and, and other types of voices. The one thing that's very striking is that all of this is hugely enabled if um, MOOCs use open licenses, which of course they can do, they don't automatically do so, which is why there's so much discussion around the MOOCs are open or not, but when they do, it makes reuse and, and co-creation and co-construction so much easier. And I think that's all. Anything else you want to add? Yeah. That's all from us for now. Yeah, it's been quite a lot of new chat. Yeah, there is. I was um, out of questions myself, but. I was going to go, like, it, since Catherine is the last one there, like, that really quick um, question from Catherine asking about the Writing Your World MOOC. Um, so she's saying, um, is Writing Your World designed as part of existing UCT program? 
Um, it, um, yes. It, yes. Um, um, current, it's based on the current first year um, program. Um, but it's a shorter part of it, so it was developed from a current first year program um, that's offered to <coughs> um, undergraduates who come and join the extended degree um, program here. Um, but what the conveners have decided in the future is that now that they offer, they offer their own program in the first semester, but because it's limited um, space, they're going to offer the MOOC version in the second semester from 2018 onwards as a wrapped um, program on, on campus. And so they are going to be able to use it more flexibly and that they'll, be, they'll offer places to students who aren't part of the extended degree program or who couldn't fit in to their current um, workload. So it is based on their existing work. It's, not, it's something that they um, have developed in terms of the academic literacies um, uh, field that they, they are in. But because they're quite happy with the way that they have developed the course's considerable investment, um, they're planning to do what we, we refer to as wrapping, which is that a facility that, well, it's going to be in a way a half a wrap and half a flip, and they're deciding how best to do that. I'm going to go with Jenny's question in a second. But, um, what I like about your approach is, so when we're talking about MOOCs, a lot of the people would, um, a lot of the yeah people creating MOOCs would focus on the massive aspect of the MOOC and about the online aspect of, of, of the MOOC, but not necessarily the the open the open aspect of, of a MOOC. Um, so going with Jenny's question there, she says, did you find Coursera or Future Learn easier or harder to manage in terms of, you know, like the, this kind um, of an open bit, basically? Okay. Um, if I understand the question, um, they both platforms, um, despite people thinking that you have to license, you have to keep pop, we, that you can't open a license, we found no problems with either of the platforms. We just stipulated in our contracts that we had the option and the right to license the um, course materials as we wanted. And so that was, in a way, fairly easy. We it would be more difficult, and I'm talking about the design team here, more difficult to discuss and engage with the educators because we thought they might be um, reluctant to, as many you know, academics can be. But perhaps it was because it was a MOOC and it was kind of outside of their norm and provenance of work, but they were remarkably open, ironically, to, to open licensing. And we found that we didn't really have to persuade them. They, they just didn't want to do it themselves in the sense of actually understanding licensing and which license and all the nitty gritty of it. But because they had help and support, it was relatively easy to do that. Um, what we did find was that um, we talked about it. They were like, oh, it's a great idea. Yes, that's fine. Do it. But once the MOOC had launched and they got emails from people saying, could I use your materials and can we sign a license agreement and can we do this? And they'd send it through to us and we said, actually, it's already openly licensed. And that's when they really realized what open licensing meant um, in the large part. So in terms of whether it, there was no difference for us in terms of FutureLearn and Coursera, having spoken to other Coursera and FutureLearn partners, it does seem that the contracts um, are different. So some, somebody did tell us that they couldn't do that, which was um, a surprise to us. But certainly when we were having discussions, maybe it was the timing of when we signed the contracts that there weren't any restrictions for us. Um, I think the default is, is not to have open licensing, um, but uh, we didn't find any particular challenges apart from just the work of doing it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, Jenny, yeah, just, Jenny to, just, to, just to respond to your, um, you're saying that's great. To actually, they have absolutely. 
And in fact, the, the funny thing is when we were talking to them in the contract about um, CC licensing, they then said, yes, that's fine, but only do CC by. And we said, oh, well, that's very open, of course, Sarah. But I think we then realized that was because they wanted the right to be able to monetize it if they wanted to as well later. So it was one of these kind of strange conversations where we, we were all coming at it in different ways, but we were able to kind of come together over CC BY. Um, in the end, we just said we would license it according to the license that we wanted. Um, but they they were, if we were going to license it under Creative Commons for some reason, they wanted CC BY. While we wait for another question, um, I'm going to ask one myself. So, and I'm very interested in this idea of the facilitator um, because there was I was reading something on Twitter recently, and it had to do with uh, somebody was asking why, and I, I might be completely wrong. So, Martina, you can give out to me if you want. But they they were saying that uh, MOOCs weren't that great or that big in in Germany because, um, you know, it, it wasn't really, the cost wasn't really that important. Um, and uh, the idea to sell MOOCs in Germany would be more as in, you know, it, they enable another way, like different ways of teaching. Um, and that way, that's where the role of your facilitator comes in because you have something which is supposed to be an online or it's designed to be an online experience and then it's taken by a facilitator and brought to a face-to-face -face situation. So I was wondering, and I think there is a wonderful research project there that's in what is the role of the facilitator in, in, in a MOOC, but I was wondering, is that something that you expected? Is that something that you prompted somehow? So did you actually plant the idea yourself? So is it something that happened? Yeah. Um, okay, so for the um, Education for All MOOC, it just happened. That was one of our earlier MOOCs, and we were finding our feet. And we just heard about a few groups that had set up um, and started talking about MOOCs. And we did think, oh, and, and they, was, they were asking questions, and we said, oh, we really need to create a facilitator's guide and offline version. So we did a little bit of work around that. Um, but it was really the social innovations MOOC that prompted that. It was interesting that right from the beginning, the educators, um, because they were working with this um, NGO, Social Enterprise, R Labs, which had these cafes, they were, and they knew that people didn't have um, devices, so they invited people in their communities to come to the cafes to do the MOOC. And when the, uh, the educators at the Graduate School of Business found out about this, they um, said, well, we'll pay for some facilitators or we'll support the facilitators. That was more of a formal program that that happened. Um, but I think this kind of issue of wrapping MOOCs um, is not particularly new. Um, even if, you know, when the MOOCs project here first started, um, the UCT Postgraduate Office was offering um, a wrapped MOOCs program where they um, they selected MOOCs, not necessarily ours, just from the MOOC world, and that they were inviting postgraduate students here at UCT, often who are quite isolated, to come and join um, a, a class um, where they were flipping particular MOOCs like presentation skills and research skills. So that's something that's been in our environment, and in fact, one of the members of our MOOC learning design team actually did her master's um, research on wrapped MOOCs. So that is something that it, we, we've been aware of it and we now encourage it more and more. Um, and there have been, it's been both from the kind of the, the educator side and also from the community side. So I've had people who have emailed and said, I'm running this in this library. But the bandwidth is really poor. Oh, can you give me the entire MOOC on a flash disk? And I do. I've sort of met people on street corners and handed over um, a, a flash drive with all the MOOC materials on. And again, because it's openly licensed, it's, it's really easy for us to do. And then they've loaded it onto a local server. 
And then sometimes we hear what happens after that, and sometimes we don't. So we just know that the, the things are out there. Great, thanks. I wanna, so since you mentioned licenses again, I'm going to, I'm going to Matthias question. So he's wondering about CC licenses and seeming to be the solution. So how to convince an administration from a university to allow their teachers to use open licenses? <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, I mean, I think that the question of how you persuade senior decision makers about anything is a complicated one. And you have to have multiple strategies. So the work that's been done from on MOOCs can't be separated from the work that, is, that has been done around open access and the open access policy at the university. And it's also part of the um, intellectual property policy of the university where Creative Commons licenses were included in the IP policy. Um, and you have to do what you have to do whenever you're trying to make traditional universities change, which is go to committees and make the case. Somebody told me once that you have to make your case seven times before it actually gets heard. So you make the case at least seven times in multiple committees. Um, the one thing that we really did achieve in our open access policy is that we included open education resources as part of that open access policy, which I think is was, is quite unusual. Um, what we found with the educators rather than the senior decision makers is that they don't have a problem in principle. Where you hit the sticking point is not actually at the level of principle. Where we hit the sticking point is at the level of practice. Because the, the technical work of, of putting Creative Commons licenses, choosing Creative Commons licenses, uploading materials, um, educators and academics and people don't want to do so that's where that's where the real sticking point is who's going to do that is it going to be your learning designers is it going to be administrators is it going to be librarians how's that work actually going to get done so from there i'm going to pick on martina's question um and she says you showed that the social innovations MOOC promoted interfaculty use and collaboration. Um, so would this be a way to promote a university-wide use of CC licenses and reuse? Uh, I, think, I think the the issue that just picking up on what Laura said is that we had an enabling environment because the university policy enabled that. We've had teams but they just can't do it if your if your institutional policy does not enable um, the academics to release their materials with creative commons licenses there's not really much a team can do um, or if the institution holds the copyright and they then re-grant that so it, it still is it's difficult to do this from the ground up unless you've got a kind of first enabling policy that allows. So I've met people doing other MOOCs who really are very open and would really like to release their MOOC materials as OER or as open content, but they actually just can't because their MOOC project is funded by some central entity. It's primarily, you know, it's not primarily, but it's it's about branding and institutional um, uh, IP and they just can't do anything about it. Um, an interesting example that we've come across is an, an educator at the university who also has a similar issue where the University of Michigan um, keeps copyright or does not allow relicensing um, uh, of the materials um, and it's, it's institutional copyright. And so what he does, and I'm not even sure how, but he, he takes, he records an identical lecture at his home that he then relicenses as Creative Commons um, in order to meet his personal goals of releasing his MOOC materials as OER. But that's quite a commitment to do everything twice. But that's something that um, I came across which I found quite interesting. So I think in terms of, yes, you can build, you can use something like um, the popularity of MOOCs to 
draw attention to the value of OER. Um, and it's probably, as Laura was saying, a longer term process of engagement. Um, but it's really difficult to just uh, in, um, expect individual academics if they don't have an enabling policy to just to be able to do that. Yeah, that's massive. The issue, the, the issue, I mean, the issue of copyright and the fact that as much to produce is is quite quite a barrier. Um, any more questions from our lovely audience? Um, I have another one, but I don't want to. I don't want to be me asking all the time. <laughs> um, Okay, Chris is typing, somebody else is typing. Uh, okay, I'll ask my question then, please. Um, this is kind of a researchy question, which I think might be useful. Okay, no, well, let's go to let's go to Jenny's question. So did the partners facilitators understand the license you were using fully? Ooh. Um, um... No, probably not, <laughs> not, not in its details. Um, and yeah, um, they, they were, they were not very familiar with Creative Commons licenses. They kind of tended to conflate it with open source and open access. Um, but generally it, it's interesting. Our MOOCs have become just progressively more open in terms of Creative Commons licenses. So we, I think we initially, when we first started, we had a very complicated first MOOC um, called Medicine and the Arts with something like 18 presenters. And it was it was one of those courses that people were quite sensitive about their content. So we actually licensed it under CC by NDMC because people, the educators were quite nervous about people theoretically, you know, taking a bit of it and remixing it and, and misrepresenting them. Then we kind of got over that and we've moved to CC by NC for the next one. And then I think after that, everything's been CC by. And I think we, as the, the educate, sort of the learning design team became much more comfortable with some of the implications. Um, and the educators seem to, to follow along. Um, and, in, and as I mentioned earlier, their understanding has grown because people have asked them for reuse. Um, and so they, you know, they used to email us and say, can we allow these people to reuse the materials? And we'd say, yes, according to the license, you can. And now they just do that themselves. We sometimes get copied into an email um, about that. So it is an issue around understanding. And it's not an easy thing because, um, especially if you have taken, if you've built something using another license and then it's like remixing. So we've tried to discourage people from using CC BY SA because then that causes issues if you want to remix it with some the, something else and we know that so if we want to encourage people to reuse which is really one of our the stuff for these community-based MOOCs in particular that that is a overt explicit aim take these materials and use them um, so really a CC BY license um, makes the most sense awesome um, this is Few, there's a couple of people wondering about your writing your world MOOC. So maybe this is not the right place to share about this, but maybe it's just okay if you tweet something like yeah, yeah, yeah. like and then pass it on to so pass it on to yes, yes. Okay. That would be great. Um say I can send can... you another version of the PowerPoint with the links in if if you would like. Yeah, that'd that be great. Sense. I, I, uh, yeah, because then I can, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll embed it in, in, in the blog post about this presentation. So the uh, people we have, okay, so that, that's great. Okay, we nearly, it's nearly half three, I suppose it's half four over in South Africa or wherever it is that you are. One last question, anybody, or will we wrap it up? Let me see who what's coming.
are you going to get content of this webinar? I love the content. <laughs> the, uh, the webinar has been, it's been recorded. So what I'll do as, as soon as, as soon as we, we're done, I'll, I'll get the recording ready and I'll upload it to, to YouTube, um, to the GoGN site in YouTube and I'll tweet all the details. So, um, yeah, don't worry. You can catch all the, all the discussions and all the conversations later on. Uh, okay, one very last question from me. Um, it's just because I think it might be interesting from you know for 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 our PhD researchers from from a kind of a practical point of view. You've talked, you've gathered all these wonderful stories of impact. So how did you go about collecting those stories? Okay. Initially, we, were, we just took them and put them somewhere, but we have done a few things. We, we track, we have a tracking document, the Google Doc, that tracks impacts for each date, because when we want to do this kind of presentation, we want to go back to it. And more formally, we have a learner stories project where we invite learners from um, who have taken our MOOCs and who have found value to um, submit a video story and we have a YouTube playlist of those in production and periodically we gather them all together and make a nice video. So we think that visual and video storytelling is a really nice way of sort of communicating what's happening. And we have um, sort of further ongoing research projects um, as well. So at the moment we, well we've got one in particular um, which is called the MOOC Takers Research Project which I'm part of which is around researching formally the value that students are finding um, in uh, our MOOCs and um, we, we have, we, we're doing that through the lens of transitions and we're, we're unpacking what transitions mean but at the moment it's around uh, the movements that people make between work and study and study and career and in and out of those life stages. And we're looking at what MOOCs have to contribute in this space, and that really is around gathering stories um, of perceived value. So there's sort of informal communication activities, tracking, and also um, some formal research that we've got going. And of course, we we also have a research project that we're wrapping up now, looking at MOOCs and open education practices. It's all fantastic. Um, it's amazing because it's having, I, I must confess, I wasn't having a particularly good day. I was kind of feeling a bit down myself. And, you know, you hear all these stories and all the great stuff that people are going, are doing around the world. So that kind of, it just put a smile on my face. <laughs> yes, whenever, yes, we're, whenever feeling, we're feeling, I'm just going. <laughs> If you're feeling down, take a MOOC. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I take them all. <laughs> and when, when, I see when, I see the, when I see the pressure around uh, MOOCs and the commercialization of MOOCs, I look back at these examples of how MOOCs can still be used to, to support a social justice agenda. And it's not something we should give up on. I really feel very strongly about that. Yes, I completely agree with you. And um, on that wonderful note, I think we're going to leave it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Sukina. Thank you to all our, our, you know, the wonderful audience. Some of you knew, some of you have been here before, but it's always great to have you all. And um, hopefully I will see you next month. Actually, next month we'll have TJ Bliss. Uh, he's going to be the our next um, speaker for the November GoGN webinar. So um, looking forward to that. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody. And thank you particularly. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We'll see you soon. We might even see you in two weeks' time, I believe. <laughs> okay, okay, guys. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody.